Only grim news today, I'm afraid. 22 people are dead and one more is missing after a fire ripped through a lithium-ion battery factory in South Korea. One defective cell was all it took. One cell went Vesuvius initially, sparking a chain reaction that quickly consumed the 35,000 battery cells stored on the factory's second floor. According to a senior fire official on site, it took just 15 seconds for that floor to be filled with smoke and flames. He added, quote, The smoke was so toxic you could lose your consciousness after taking one or two breaths. Just let that sink in for a moment and imagine the same thing in an underground car park. 15 seconds, you and the kids... How far can you all run holding your breath? And did you even clock the exits on the way in? Still, 35,000 cells, that's quite a lot of battery cells, isn't it? Surely you would never be that close to quite that many cells. This was an industrial scale accident, right? Okay, keep telling yourself that if you want, but... It's roughly the same as five Teslas parked together on the same floor of that hypothetical underground car park. There's roughly 7,000 cells in an average Tesla. Therefore, I think South Korea just sent the developed world a warning and tragically, it's written in blood. Unfortunately, there's no word yet on whether local political net zero geniuses are even listening. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au. New cars cheap, but Australia only. Website. Card. I don't want to dwell too long on the horror of all of this, and it is pretty horrific. 22 people in one event. Wow. It's a significant tragedy, in other words, and hundreds of people are directly affected by it. And I know the media loves this stuff. It's newsworthy, meaning it gets the clicks. But instead, I want to dwell on what we might all learn from it. Is there anything we can take away? What could you learn from this? Is there any actionable intelligence hidden in this story? And I would argue, shit, yeah, there is a lot. We live in a lithium-ion-powered world, increasingly so. Like, it's not just EVs, it's e-bikes and e-scooters, which are probably the least safe lithium-ion battery devices among us currently. But it's also our phones and our laptops, our tablets, cameras, lights, power tools, and more. Like, sit down and make a list, but it's going to be a long list. There's no need to be terrified by any of this technology, is there? Like, we just need to implement systems so that we can coexist with it safely. Like, milk it for all it's worth, dude, but let's do it safely. The smaller the battery, obviously, the smaller the mass of reactive chemicals contained within it. The quicker the fire, if there is one, is gonna go out, and the lower the probability of mayhem and tragedy. So here's the first thing you need to know. After trying in vain to put out the blaze with fire extinguishers, the workers rushed to an area of the floor where there was no exit. Pro tip number one, do not waste any time trying to fight a fire. If you see smoke, run, preferably upwind, especially if you're outside, go upwind. If it's heading straight towards you, go to the side and then head upwind. If you see an EV on fire out there in the street or something, get away from it, go upwind. Do not stand there with your friggin' phone filming it for social media. This is definitely not a live streaming opportunity. Pro tip number two, if you enter an underground car park, always check where the exits are. You might need to get out within... I don't know, 15 seconds. Like if you've got kids, you need to talk to them about this stuff. What to do if you see smoke, because they're not always going to be with you and it might happen to them. Today's report is sponsored by Olight. My Warrior Mini 2, dude, 
still unfreaking killable. And I do keep trying from time to time. I'm quite unreasonable like that. One day I'm going to get it. The Olight Prowess is new. This is a 5000 lumen torch with a secondary warm white lamp mode, plus a magnetic end cap with a quarter 20 standard tripod thread. Essentially, it's a super bright torch plus a lamp, multi brightness mode, and there's a kit with their purpose built tactical tripod also available. The Baton 4 Premium Edition comes in its own recharging backup battery case. It's a tiny little light, you're not even going to feel it in your pocket, yet it delivers 1,300 lumens. And the case will recharge the torch up to five times if you're on the go. For hunting and camping, here's the Fortitude 2 fixed blader with my Carter handles and a full tang. It's made of matte black coated CPMS 35VN steel, which is basically the gold standard for toughness and edge retention. So I doubt it would balk at being batoned through hard wood and other demanding survival type applications in the bush. And finally, for all you hunters and collectors out there, Olight's Odin S is a rail mount 1500 lumen flashlight with a remote multi-mode pressure switch for rifles. It's been upgraded recently for maximum recoil durability. My favourite Olights remain the Warrior Mini, which is ideal for everyday carry. The Swivel, like you are crazy if you do not have a Swivel in the shed and one in the car. The Warrior X3, if there's a zombie apocalypse, this is the one. And the Marauder Mini, which is my go-to torch for camping, boating and search. It's a floodlight and a spotlight trapped in the same body. Olight's June sale starts today at 8pm, Tuesday, June the 25th, and it ends on Thursday at midnight. Discounts up to 35%, links in the description, plus a discount code if you miss the sale. This now from the New York Times concerning the South Korean factory fire. Fires can occur in lithium batteries when the inside layers are compressed, causing a short circuit. Yeah, and when that happens, the short leads to a spike in temperature and consequentially a thermal runaway if it goes on for long enough. So pro tip number three, if you run over something in your shiny new EV and it goes clunk on the underbody, that is such a red flag. Over the next few days, you're gonna have to be real careful. Do not park in the garage, park outside, get the car checked. The damage and the fire, if there is one, could be separated by several days. Batteries are just like that. Pro tip number four, if you are working with a power tool and you drop the tool and or a battery, isolate the battery, put it in a location where if it goes up, it's not going to kill you and destroy your vehicle and or your house. More than 160 firefighters along with 60 fire engines rushed to contain the fire. Lithium ion battery fires do not burn like conventional combustible materials. They are far more severe than that. And you cannot put them out by just smothering them or otherwise depriving them of oxygen because they make their own oxygen gas as the electrolyte decomposes. So you really just have to wait for the whole reaction to stop. That's what the fire brigades do all around the world. Pro tip number five, therefore, I would not install an EV charger in my garage, nor would I park an EV in there, especially if there are bedrooms or other living spaces above. The place to charge an EV is pretty clearly outside in the clear. Which leads to pro tip number six. In apartment blocks and other locations like shopping malls that have underground car parks, it makes far more sense to put EV chargers outside on an apron. Like if a dozen Teslas go up in an underground car park, there's a real risk of significant structural collapse as the heat attacks the steel inside the concrete and it loses its ability to constrain the tensile loads in the concrete beams. And yeah, it just takes one Tesla, right, to catch fire. 
The rest might just get invited in, in an impromptu way to join the freaking party by the surrounding heat. You have to realise that charging is a real point of vulnerability for battery fires and customers so want EV charging to be as fast as possible, or as I prefer to think about it, as risky as possible. The only thing keeping an EV safe when it's charging, or when discharging heavily, frankly, is the battery cooling system that's built in. And as EVs age, cooling systems are going to get less reliable, mechanical damage is going to get more prevalent, and other age-related factors, like the second law of thermodynamics, which is pretty much the matrix, will make things even more entertaining in the domain of EVs and safety slash reliability. If a cooling system fails on charging or some protection circuit fails to shut things down in time, you better call the nearest 160 firefighters. On February the 10th this year, an American billionaire named Angela Chow had a lovely little dinner on her modest Texas estate for her insufferable billionaire and otherwise influential friends. I note I didn't see you there, dude, mainly because I wasn't there either. So there's that. Mrs. Chow got fairly drunk, meaning 0.233, which is nearly five times the legal driving limit here in Australia. And this, of course, is perfectly allowed I'm not going to be throwing a stone here, you know, living in this glass house. It was a bit chilly in that evening too, so, you know, February in Texas outside, so she didn't want to walk back to her domicile. She decided to drive home all within her 900-acre estate. So nothing illegal about any of that, just kind of entitled and ever so slightly stupid. Unfortunately, though, she mistakenly reversed her Tesla Model X into a pond after mistaking reverse for drive, which is easy to do at 0.233, especially given Elon's chicken shit control architecture. He is otherwise a genius, admittedly. The car sunk, right? And after some time and several phone calls from the depths of the pond, which is kind of macabre, Mrs. Chow sadly passed away. All that wealth didn't especially help in this situation. One of the salient contributing factors to her death was the lengthy discussion on site by first responders about whether it was actually safe to enter the water to rescue her or whether the Tesla would electrocute them because, you know, electricity and water, so dangerous. <sighs> Pro tip number seven. You can actually swim with an EV. It cannot easily electrocute you in the water. Pro tip number eight. Do not expect the fire brigade or other rescue services to have even half a freaking clue about how to deal with any kind of life-threatening electric car problem. It's absolutely no different here in Australia. Ambient commentary from fire and rescue agencies here on battery fires and electric cars is astonishingly poorly informed. These people only get on the news because they're there on site at the tragedy and they're in uniform. So, hey, authority. This is, of course, not the same thing as knowing shit from clay with EVs or anything else. Back to South Korea now. This factory was just 45 kilometres out of Seoul, right? So hardly out in the boonies. It was owned by a company called Aracel and it specialised in essentially shoveling little cells into dirty big battery boxes to augment electricity networks. So, pretty high-tech operation. Definitely not just a pile of batteries sitting out in some field next to a vat of, I don't know, fermenting cabbage or something. And when something like this happens, politicians, of course, anywhere in the world, just can't seem 
to shut up. President Yoon Suk Yeol called on the government to quote, mobilize all available human resources and equipment. Alternatively, abject political dickheads like President Yoon might like to go back in time in some machine and put decent industrial safety legislation in place preemptively. Separate a stack of, I don't know, 35,000 freaking batteries by placing them into little sub-stacks of perhaps 5,000 apiece, each in their own containment zone, so that if one goes up, the other 30,000 can't just join the party. How hard is this? South Korea has a totally shit record with fire safety, incidentally. In 2017, 29 people were killed at a fire in a gym and a bathhouse. In 2018, around 50 people, most of them elderly, died from toxic smoke inhalation during a fire in a hospital that didn't have a sprinkler system. Back in 2008, 40 workers, most of them immigrants, like those who died in the current incident, died in a fire in a cold storage warehouse that was under construction. And I'd suggest on this, we could be here all day. Here in Australia, about nine months ago, if memory serves, morons from Europe car removed a damaged battery from an MG EV in their holding yard, which is about 50 metres from the air traffic control tower at Sydney Airport. You can see where this is going. I couldn't make this up. Nobody could. They just left it there, out there, outside, peacefully on the tarmac for several frickin' days, as you do. What could possibly go wrong? Well, here's one thing. It could short-circuit and catch frickin' fire and take five nearby cars with it. That's conceivable. One EV and four combustion cars all burnt out within a bee's frickin' endothallus of shutting down our country's biggest airport. I do wonder if that goes into the statistics and helps, quote-unquote, prove that ice cars just burn more often than EVs. Probably. In a sane country, this would be a real wake-up call, this kind of stuff. Like the writing's on the wall, is it not? But here, net zero senior political geniuses won't let you know, trivial inconveniences, such as public safety, block the road to electric utopia. And to be fair, electric utopians themselves use a quaint logical fallacy to tell us that this is not really necessary anyway. They say EVs don't catch fire as often as combustion cars, so that's okay. I've had plenty of that in the comments. I'm actually not sure that that claim is quite as true as they say, because the average age of an EV in Australia is going to be, what, two or three years old or something, while the average car is about nine, and obviously reliability diminishes with age, and nobody, to my knowledge, has controlled for the variable of age with respect to analysing any fires. There are plenty of other causal factors that need to be properly analysed before you can just say, oh, EVs are so much safer, dude. Like, it doesn't work that way. Anyway, irrespective of all of that, EV fires, you can't argue with this, are hotter and more toxic, and they cannot be fought conventionally because they bring their own oxygen to the frickin' party, as discussed. You cannot put one out, certainly not easily. So, clearly, we need to rethink the fire safety regulations in respect of EVs and also other battery appliances. Is this not just common sense? We're not going to stop using lithium-ion batteries, and I'm certainly not advocating that, because they're so freaking awesome in so many applications. We just need to implement adequate safeguards as a matter of urgency. So, if you're thumping the keyboard right now and demanding a retraction because, quote, ice cars burn more often, you idiot, shut up, kind of thing, please do. I, I'm up for that, if you are. I get it, okay? EVs are 
a religion for you in this situation and the religious hate one thing above all else, which would be criticism. But answer me this before we go, okay? If someone you love were to die, hypothetically, I hope it doesn't happen, but hypothetically, if they croak because some other dipshit's Tesla goes up in an underground car park and your loved one just happens to be there during the wrong 15 seconds, or perhaps the exit is just more than 15 seconds away and two breaths or something, is it going to be adequate consolation for you to know that this event was statistically unlikely? Does that make it okay? Because we don't want to hinder the transition to electric utopia, do we? Or would you prefer the political dipshit class, both here in Australia and also overseas, just to get off its fat ass for a change and implement adequate systematic safeguards for lithium-ion batteries among us now? <laughs>